Good afternoon and welcome to everyone. I have the honor uh, this afternoon of introducing Dr. Ajit Fernando as our first speaker this fall for the Henry Center Scripture and Ministry Lecture Series. Uh, for those of you who are new to this series, the Henry Center typically invites distinguished Christian speakers who can address issues and concerns that are of crucial importance for relating scripture and ministry. It allows us to bring together pastors, community members, TED's faculty, and students, all of us coming together for a time of learning and fellowship. And uh, we do have some um, sign-up uh, sheets on the chairs. Um, if you are not receiving regular email updates from us, if you can fill those out, and uh, we have uh, staff members at the back who can take them, and we'll include you on our mem uh, mailing list. We're delighted that Dr. Ajit Fernando has been so willing to spend this time with us to share some of his wisdom and experience. Dr. Fernando has been National Director of Youth for Christ in Sri Lanka since 1976. He studied at Asbury Theological Seminary and Fuller Seminary. <clears throat> He's a lecturer in Colombo Theological Seminary in Lanka Bible College, and he has a truly worldwide ministry. He's a tremendously prolific author, and his books always, always drive us back to God, to his holy scriptures, and to what it means to follow Christ faithfully. And this is a bit of a warning, but like every good preacher, he seems to have that peculiar gift, the ability to comfort the disturbed and also disturb the comfortable. Some of his recent books are Acts, The Message of Jesus in Action, which you can find in the Bringing the Bible to Life series, a helpful uh, Bible study guide. His co-authors were Karen Jobes and Karen Lee Thorpe. A lot of us know his book, Jesus Driven Ministry by IVP. Other helpful books are his The Call to Joy and Pain by Crossway, his NIV application commentary on Acts, and his older book, The Supremacy of Christ. Many, many people have been strengthened and encouraged by his writings. But more important than all these impressive accomplishments is his love for patient Bible exposition and his work with his wife, Nelun, in Colombo, serving the poor, shepherding first-generation Christians and working in a drug rehabilitation ministry and similar nitty-gritty um, examples of gospel labor, the joy and suffering of serving others. Um, in his book, Jesus Driven Ministry, he urges us to be Bible Christians who are, in his words, saturated in the word. My friends, that is indeed the kind of evangelical biblical Christianity that all of us can believe in. His talk today is titled Scripture as the Base for Ministry. We are therefore expectant, ready to learn from Dr. Fernando about how we and our ministries, both in theory and in practice, can be saturated with Scripture. Before he comes to address us, let me open our time in prayer. Teach us, O Lord, to follow your decrees then we will keep them to the end. Give us understanding, and we will keep your law and obey it with all our heart. Direct us in the path of your commands, for there we will find delight. Turn our hearts towards your statutes and not towards selfish gain. Turn our eyes away from worthless things. Renew our lives according to your word. How we long for your precepts. Renew our lives in your righteousness. Lord, we thank you for your word from Psalm 119, and we pray that even now you will use our brother, Ajit Fernando, to convince us again of the sufficiency of scripture in ministry. We pray these things for Christ's sake. Amen. I am very grateful for this privilege of being able to speak today uh, for some personal reasons also. Uh, Carl Henry had a huge influence on the churches in our part of the world. When he was at his prime, he used to give three months a year to travel to other countries. Uh, you know, he used to go to the 
what was then the communist countries, and he would come to places like Sri Lanka. And um, our church in Sri Lanka during that time was heavily influenced by liberalism. Those of us who were evangelicals were considered just oddballs who have committed intellectual suicide. And, uh, and this man was brilliant. In fact, he was so brilliant that some of our people couldn't understand what he was saying. Um, uh, and Carl Henry had a way of speaking like that. Uh, but he, was, um, uh, he, he showed us that Christ, uh, evangelicals can truly uh, believe in the Bible and not commit, they don't have to commit intellectual suicide. And uh, my father used to organize his visits to Sri Lanka. He stayed in our home. And when I wanted to uh, do my theological studies, uh, he is one of the two people who wrote to the seminary that I went to uh, and, uh, so that uh, I can come here for studies. And while I was there, and also after I went back, he kept writing letters to me regularly. Uh, very unusual. He had a typewriter that had terrible type. You know, it, you, you, when you see the letter, you know it's, it's Carl Henry's letter uh, because it was all, you know, uh, the, the type was not right. Uh, but, um, but he would write. And until he st started losing his uh, intellectual abilities, I mean, his ability to, you know, he, he was getting senile. Until then, he, he used to write to me regularly. So it's a real joy for me to be able to speak at a function uh, connected with Carl Henry. I am going to speak uh, on the topic of the lecture, which is uh, using the Bible in ministry, but I'm going to do it by explaining how we learnt how to use the Bible in our ministry. I work for Youth for Christ, and um, I've been doing that for the last 34 years, we are primarily an evangelistic youth organization. And I just want to share with you how the Bible influenced the way uh, we do our ministry. Um, uh, the famous passage on 2 Timothy 3.16 uh, on the inspiration of scripture is more actually not on the inspiration but on the practicability of scripture. How scripture can be used and very often we use it as a proof text for inspiration, but it's much more than that. Uh, it says all scripture, uh, this is uh, three, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be com competent, equipped for every good work. Um, so we are talking about a life fashioned by scripture. And what I'm hoping to talk about is an organization fashioned by scripture, whose activities are all coming from a scriptural base. To many, the Bible is only a source book of inspiration, sadly today, not the textbook for fashioning one's thinking and acting. And I think with the marketing orientation that we have today, uh, it, it can have a negative impact on the way we use the scriptures. There's a huge challenge that we face to win the attention of people and to keep that attention. And in that process, uh, in trying to do that, we have developed attractive programs to bring people to our churches. Uh, but that is only part of our agenda. Not only must we bring them and keep them, we must win them and then see their behavior modified according to the scriptures. And that's the huge challenge that we have. Um, as, as was already mentioned, to develop Bible Christians, uh, people whose lives are fashioned by the scriptures. Now, 2 Timothy 2.15 talks about this, uh, talking about people who can handle the word of God, right? Study to, you know, do your best to show yourself approved unto God, um, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Uh, I'm sure you have, you're familiar with the famous uh, statement, you know, you give a fish to a person and you feed him for a day, you teach him how to fish, and you uh, d feed him for a lifetime. Uh, and uh, so we are, we are talking about using the scriptures, teaching people to use the scripture. So the challenge before us is a threefold challenge. Firstly, to teach all the truths of the Bible, the pleasant ones and the unpleasant ones, to ensure that, uh, and to use our creativity that to ensure 
that they get the whole counsel of God to use the best possible method to communicate the scriptures. That's our first challenge. Secondly, to do it in such a way that it is assimilated and it affects behavior so that people's behavior changes as a result of scripture. And thirdly, to help them to become Bible Christians, skilled in handling the word so that they look at life from a biblical mind, so that every decision that is made is made out of a biblical principle. So this is the challenge before us. For example, in Youth for Christ, I work for Youth for Christ, and uh, we are often accused of being superficial, uh, not really spiritual, wasting our time play, doing fun things, and you know, not serious uh, because of all the fun things that we are doing. That's what we are often accused of being in Youth for Christ. And, um, and what I say is that we are very serious about fun. Because our, uh, our understanding of fun comes out of a theology of pleasure, out of a theology of youth uh, in Ecclesiastes 11 and 12 that talks about remember your creator in the days of your youth. Before that, it says that young people, while you're young, you follow your instincts. You have fun. You do what you want to do. Of course, remember that everything you do is going to be judged. Uh, that it says that. And then it says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. And why? Because when you get old, you can't have fun. That's what it really says. I mean, uh, I'm using my own language here. But, uh, but that's the basic idea, that when you get old, you, you can't do all these fun things. So, so come, to, come to God when you're young, so that you can really enjoy life. So what I'm saying is, even our approach to fun come, must come out of a theology. A theology of pleasure. Uh, so that's why I say we are serious about fun. Uh, so, the, um, so the aim is not only to have the personal lives of Christians, but also the community life, the body life, the organizational life, the ministry strategy, all to be influenced by scripture. The dream uh, of how people handle the word is found in Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 to 9. Uh, first, of course, there is love the Lord of your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And then verse 7, uh, seven says, um, teach them to your children. The word in the Hebrew has the idea of repeat them. In other words, um, have a strong teaching ministry. Then uh, verse 7, uh, B, the second part, talk about them when you sit in the home, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. This is holy conversation, scripture-based conversation being part of the way we talk. You know, uh, that, that, that people, when they are chatting, they are chatting about scripture, and they are chatting scripturally. I mean, this takes place in the small group also, but primarily through scriptural uh, conversation in daily life. And that, of course, is the best way to inter internalize scripture. When you're, uh, when you're facing situations and you face it with scriptural, uh, uh, with, with scriptural conversation, you're really bringing it to life, bringing it down to life. And then in verse 8 and 9, visual aids. You bind them in, on the head, on the front, in your hand, on the frontlets, be, be between your eyes, write them on the doorposts and the gates. Uh, people who are reminded constantly of scripture, that they're living under the scripture. So, uh, so that's the dream that, that people develop this type of approach to, um, to scripture. Now, um, when I was a student in this country, I think in 1975 this happened, I happened to listen to, a, I went to a, a seminar where uh, conducted by Wes Pippert, who was a Christian journalist. And he said something that in that seminar that I have never forgotten. And that is, Whatever profession you go to, take some aspect of that profession and go and see what the scriptures has to say about that profession. He said, for example, as a journalist, he looked at the idea of truth and he traced it through the scriptures to learn what the scriptures have to say about truth. And um, that, that kept the, uh, you know, working in my mind and I, I, have, I have used a slightly different approach. But when I was finishing my studies at Fuller Seminary, um, I, I knew I was going to come back as leader of the Youth for Christ movement in Sri Lanka. So, 
I took certain key texts and began to see what does it say to me in my new job. So I spent about three months on first and second Timothy uh, because here was a senior leader teaching a junior leader. So I sat down like Timothy in front of uh, Paul and I wrote down every direction, every advice that uh, Paul gave Timothy. Uh, then uh, I was going to lead an uh, evangelistic community. So we, we went through, uh, I went through Acts 1 to 13, which uh, shows the community life of, the early, of an evangelistic movement. And st I went through that again about three months, just saturating, saturating myself. This is what an evangelistic community was about. Then I went and started and tried to practice these two books in, 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 in our ministry. And then, we, uh, because God has called us to work with the poor, I, and I was reading the book of Deuteronomy, and uh, I suddenly realized that there is a lot here that is going to help us. We were working with first-generation Christians, and Paul was, uh, Moses was trying to give a new nation how to, their lifestyle, what type of lifestyle they were going to have. So I began to write down all the things that he told this new nation, uh, one by one, on justice, on how to deal with the poor, and also on how to just live as biblical people. Then later on, as we began to work and we found that young people were coming to Christ, they had uh, converted, and then they had to go into the world. And some were making it in the world, others were giving up their faith. So I took the book of Daniel and studied how Daniel was able to survive in the secular world. And actually, I have written books on all, all of these uh, books now. Uh, but, but the whole idea was take a theme that fits your ministry and study that and see how it can influence you. So that's one of the things that right at the start of my ministry I learned. Now, uh, now let me just tell you about the Youth for Christ ministry. Um, Youth for Christ started in 1964 under the leadership of a person called Sam Sherrard. And, um, and in typical 1960s uh, Youth for Christ methodology, we started having rallies. And, and, and in these rallies, people came to Christ. And one day Sam Sherrard was uh, reading, uh, was uh, going through the names of all these people who had come to Christ. And he asked himself, what has happened to these people? And he realized he didn't know. And around the same time, he read two books, New Testament Follow-Up by Whalen B. Moore and The Master Plan of Evangelism by Robert Coleman. And he realized, okay, we have to evangelize, but we've got to develop people. And so discipling became the key to our ministry. Now, Youth for Christ the International was a bit surprised. What, is, what are these people doing? You know, they are sticking to one town, uh, and they were trying to push us to go to all the towns in the major towns in Sri Lanka, but here was the leader sticking to one town and developing leaders in that one town, and they felt this is not what they should be doing, but they didn't, fortunately, they didn't, Youth for Christ has an uh, idea that each country develops its own strategy, so they allowed us to go, go and do that, and, and, and that, that's what happened, but uh, we, he developed the leaders, and as leaders began to develop, then they began to go to other towns. So over the years, the ministry has grown and grown and grown. Now we have about 75 staff, almost all who were converted in our ministry and discipled in the ministry. About 500 volunteers, again, almost all converted and discipled in this ministry. And we are working in about 150 different little, little points in the country. Uh, but, um, and out of that have come scores of church leaders, pastors, pastors' wives, and things like that. Um, so, um, so, so that was the ministry that I came into, a ministry that was doing discipling. Now, as I worked with YFC uh, from 1976, I suddenly began to see some dangers in, dis in, in this emphasis on discipling. The first, for the first danger I saw was that if you don't be careful, especially because a lot of leaders are insecure people, uh, it's the... Uh, insecurity that makes them work very hard and makes them end up as leaders. Uh, and so when, when, when leaders, uh, insecure leaders are discipling others, they could, uh, they could have too much authority. 
and Youth for Christ could become a cultic movement where the, uh, may, where the leaders make decisions for the people they disciple. And so, so then I, I began to realize that the job of the discipler is to help the people live by the word. The authority is in the word, and the authority of the leader is a derived authority. Uh, uh, the word is what, uh, what we have to do. So that finally, a lot of what the leader did in the first few years is going to be done by the word as the person matures. And, um, and if you look at the famous discipling passage, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, it says, what you have learned from me, what you have heard from me, it's the content that is passed down. You commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Four generations. But what is common in those four generations is the word. So discipling must be word-centered. Um, uh, in other words, the key to discipling is teaching people the Bible. The authority is the authority of the word and not of the discipler. So we didn't use the word master and disciple, but rather discipler and disciple. Uh, the person is being discipled, uh, is, going, is being helped to, to follow Jesus, to become a disciple of Jesus. So he's a disciple of the discipler. Uh, so, so that was one of the first things that I, I learned. And then uh, I, I realized that growth and Christian living has to be done within the context of the body. You know, there is no such thing as an individual Christian. Uh, and Acts 2 showed that very strongly. And actually, as you go through Acts, you realize it's, a very, it's very much of a community going forward, not individuals trying to grow. So we realized that these people have to grow in groups. Uh, and the groups became, became the, the, the environment in which the discipling took place. Uh, so so, so uh, the, the Bible uh, be, uh, taught us now that uh, this is not an individual thing, it's a group thing, it's a body thing. Then uh, I, re I realized other things about the, body, uh, about the body. For example, I began to realize that the local, I mean, I always knew that because I grew up in a church, but most of the Youth for Christ people were converted in YFC, so they hadn't grown up in churches. And so what happened was we, that, the, the, that the local church is the primary expression of the body of Christ. Now, um, and so therefore, our work is not complete until these people are settled in churches. Now, that was the thing that I found hardest to, to convince our people. Because they hadn't met Christ in churches, they didn't see the value of churches. And it took me many years uh, to implement uh, this particular aspect of our ministry. Partly because we didn't have many uh, evangelical churches, so the only churches that, could, that we could send our people to were, were, were very liberal type churches. Uh, so, so that was part of the problem. So what we realized was that the body of Christ theology has a huge moderating influence upon any movement. For example, you can't keep, for us it meant we couldn't keep people to ourselves, we have to hand them over to the church. Another thing, uh, th these other people are also part of the body. Therefore, I cannot do anything that is going to hurt this body in order to fulfill my programs. Because in, the, in a body, if one group is growing at the expense of another, that means that that, that, that growing group of cells is cancerous. Uh, and, and so we, we can't hurt another group. Uh, and then, so, so what, we did, what we did was that we... Uh, once the people come to Christ, you can't send them immediately to church because the church culture is so different to the culture of the people that we were working with. So what we did was we brought them into small groups, but the leader of the small group had to be a church member. And little by little, they start taking them to church. And some of them will stay in churches and leave YFC. Others will come, remain in YFC as volunteers while being members of churches, and then when their volunteer period is over, they can do all their service within the church. So that was, um, that was uh, what we started doing. Now, there were some, some of our groups that didn't do that, and we found that those groups, uh, they, they didn't see much success because you can be in a youth group only for a certain time. Uh, after some time, you become bored with the program. So if by the time you become bored, unless you're called to youth ministry, uh, by the time you become bored, if you're not settled in a church, you're going to be a terrible demotivation. You're a senior person, 
senior volunteer, and uh, terrible demotivation to the younger ones. So those ministries had serious problems as we went on. Another thing we, we, uh, regarding the body of Christ, uh, I, I found this word in the Greek, homo to madon, which is, uh, be, uh, no, unfortunately, the NIV and a lot of translations often uses together when translating that. But the older Bibles use the word with one mind or with one accord. What does it mean to be of one accord? Uh, how did the, for example, in Acts 15, how they grappled together and they came to be of one mind? Um, and, and I, we felt that that's the way we want to run our community. So without using voting or uh, dictatorial sort of you do this because I'm the leader, uh, we, we battle until consensus is reached. And sometimes this uh, consensus came uh, quickly. Sometimes it took a long time. But we battled and battled and battled until we could all agree. But what we found was that once you have agreed like that, you catch up for lost time because the people are all motivated. And because they're motivated, they will, uh, they will uh, you know, continue with the, with the vision that, was, that came. So the, so the scriptures uh, challenged us in this way. Uh, still talking about the body life, as we began to work with the poor, we had to ask ourselves, how can these poor people become saints? Because they have a different understanding of identity, of integrity, of honesty, of truthfulness, completely different idea. Uh, how, can they, how can we develop ownership uh, amongst the members who have come to Christ in Youth for Christ? How can they become leaders one day? How can they become people of integrity? This was a huge challenge. And we looked at Acts, and we looked at Acts 2 and 4, and realized that one of the keys was of the early community was that they shared all things in common. In other words, and that many of the instances of this common sharing had to do with money. So that they are, when they were of one heart and one mind, they were of one heart and one mind regarding money also. Now usually in fellowship, in a fellowship, that's the one thing that we don't share with our colleagues. You know, on, on, our, on how we spend our money and how, where, from where we get our money and things like that. Whereas the, the word koinonia was originally used of business partnerships. It had a lot to do with money. So we, we, we asked ourselves, how can we develop a group where the rich and the poor feel equal and where, there is, um, and, and where they feel that they can truly become one with us? Um, so then we, we said, the poor must give our salaries. In other words, we are the leaders but they must know that they are paying for our salary. And because they are paying for our salary, then they have a voice. Now let me say that when we first started having the poor come into Christ, uh, the first reaction, once they realized their oneness in Christ and that their, their identity, uh, the first reaction was one of severe anger. It was an anger that they had been treated second class. As long as they were not Christians, they accepted the class distinction. Once they became Christians, they said, hey, this is wrong. And they were angry. And we had to face rebellion, anger from, our, from, from these converts. Uh, and, and we had to face it uh, with, with, with uh, contrition, you know, because we had been wrong. I mean, our, our community had treated these people wrong. So, so, uh, so, so the, how can we give them ownership? One of the things we did was to uh, have openness regarding financial transactions. In other words, the salary book is an open book. Everyone knows. Uh, everyone, if they want to find out, can find out how much so-and-so is getting, how much so-and-so is getting. There is a system by which the salaries are given. The system is, um, um, the primary factor is need and not status or not position. There is something given for position because people in those positions have greater needs uh, for hospitality and things like that. But... Um, uh, but what happened was uh, that we, we, we developed a system like that where they could consider themselves equal in the way the money was given. And, um, and so uh, working with poor, the poor people became our staff. 
Generally, what happened was those who came from poorer backgrounds, for them, coming to Youth for Christ staff was a big crime. And those who came from richer backgrounds, for them, coming to Youth for Christ was a big drop. Uh, because we, there, there is a huge difference among the rich and the poor in salaries. Uh, but, but, but what happened was, as we began to work on these things, little by little, people began to claim ownership. And leaders began to develop amongst the poor. And that's something that, you know, I think God did. Another thing that we had to work on was lying. Uh, 1 John 1, 7. Uh, as we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ cleanses us, with, uh, uh, cleanses us from all sin. Uh, the context of that is confession. Confession, acceptance of our sin. So, uh, we, 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 uh, you know, lying in our culture is second nature. Nobody thinks it's wrong to lie. You know, that's part of the nature. It's part of the culture. How can these people be changed? So, so we began to say that. We are going to... Uh, uh, the, the, uh, and, and uh, by the way, the early church was also a shame culture, very much like our Asian culture. And, and there, there was no compromise with lying. The first sin that was judged in Acts 5 was the sin of lying, where Ananias and Sapphira. So we, we began to take... I still, when I go to our different centers, I say, you know, in, when you're in youth work, you make a lot of mistakes and you get scolded. Youth for Christ gets scolded all the time because our volunteers make mistakes. They do things that they shouldn't do. And, but that is one of the occupational hazards of youth work, you know, uh, making mistakes or doing things a little too enthusiastically. So, that, so we tell them, that's not a problem. In youth work, that's going to happen. So if you all make mistakes, if you get, uh, give a bad name to us, we'll try and settle that bad name. But that's not such a big problem. There's one thing we will not have in Youth for Christ. Lying. So we did that right through. Oh, we, we went going on and on saying that. Little by little we began to see that people who lied changed. When you have such close fellowship, you can't go on for very long lying. They either changed and some sadly left. Uh, but, but there was this thing that happened. So, so what, what happened was that Acts became a textbook, but it was a narrative. It's a narrative passage. So you can't uh, develop a lot of theologies on structures, for example, from the book of Acts. Because there are different, you know, Acts could be used to give a, to buttress different kinds of structure within the church. It gives broad principles which different people apply differently according to their culture and their needs. This is why we don't insist that everyone has to have a salary scale like ours. You know, we don't in insist on that. We felt that this is the best way for us to follow these broad principles. So in Acts, there's an inspiration to push us to certain ideals, people being of one mind, you know, a place where there is unity, where problems are, are dealt with, and things like that. And, um, and so, so that's uh, just uh, one of those uh, things that we did. Now, as we began to work with non-Christians, um, one of the issues that we faced was that our culture is very different to the Western culture in that the Western culture is a guilt-oriented culture where uh, right and wrong are determined by whether one conforms to a set of absolute principles found in the Bible or wherever, you know? And... Uh, if they fail to live up to those biblical principles, they are guilty and they have to be forgiven. Whereas in our culture, right and wrong is more a community thing. What does the community think, think is right? Um, does it bring shame to the community? Uh, in, in, in that case, anything that brings shame to the community is wrong. So you protect the name of the community. You protect the structure of the community. Um, and, and honor, anything that brings honor to the community is right. Um, so, um, so, so, uh, so it was very different to what I had grown up with. I, I grew up in a Christian, in a westernized family uh, with a strong emphasis on guilt and forgiveness and things like that. Um, we saw a, a good example of this when we had some terrible things happen in one of our centers. And so we sent a worker to, uh, to inquire and to see whether, you know, we had heard these stories, so we sent a worker. He spent about, uh, I, I think, about four or five days in that town and, and talked to everybody 
he could possibly talk to. Came back home and said, this guy, our leader, is innocent. It's wrong. What they have said is wrong. And, um, and so, uh, so we brought this guy. We are so sorry for him. We brought him. He stayed in my home. Uh, I, I gave him private uh, education on how to study the Bible over a period of about a week. Every day I taught him for this long, uh, him and his wife. And, um, and we ministered to him and sent him back home. Then one day in one of the churches in our city, a girl was crying at communion time. And um, a lady. Uh, and the pastor asked, what's the problem? And she said, I'm from Youth for Christ Manor. And some terrible things have happened in Youth for Christ. And I don't know what to do about it. And at communion, God had convicted her. And she you know, began to feel bad. So this pastor called one of our board members. The board member called the staff wife. And then we, we, uh, we began to, uh, we called this guy down. And he had done terrible things. You know, he had been abusing sexually children. He had been abusing children sexually. And it, it, terrible things had happened. But when we asked the community, and they, I mean, they were wonderful people. They are wonderful Christians. And if you ask them to pray, they pray with amazing faith. But when we asked them, did your leader do anything wrong? Everyone said wrong. No. Because their value of right and wrong was based on you know, if you bring dishonor to your leader, you're doing something terrible. It's a sin to bring dishonor to the leader. So, so we realize that this culture is very different to the culture that Westerners have been used to. So what I, I began to do was to study the Bible, tracing every place where shame is used. I took my, thank God for these computers that help us with these things, uh, just, just began to look at, Shame, shame, shame. Every place where shame is used. And I realized that shame appears a lot of times in the Bible. And it is a major motivation for holiness that we may not have used, you know, all this time. Because we didn't think that that was a big issue. For example, this of course I got not from the Bible, but from a book, but which, which was based on the Bible. Um, for, for example, Jesus took, not only took our guilt, but he also took our shame when he died on the cross. I mean, all the shameful things that happened to him. Uh, uh, our people will relate to that more than sometimes the physical and the other things, you know. So, so the shame. Um, and, and so we began to look at how can the gospel be presented in a way that is appropriate for a shame culture in a way that is fully biblical. So, when presenting the Christian life, you know, you, you present the, when you ask people to come to Christ, you must tell them what this life is all about. I mean, not only just tell uh, Jesus died for you on the cross, but if you become a Christian, this is going to be your life. Now, in our first few years, when non-Christians came to Christ, we used to always warn them, you're going to have persecution in your family, be careful, but we'll care for you. Uh, and, and you're going to be part of this new family. This is your new family. And, you know, we, we, we talked on that. And, and there is biblical basis for that. You know, Jesus said, unless you hate your father. And, you know, it goes on like that. But then we realized that the Bible also talks a lot about honoring parents, about caring for old relatives, and things like that. And so we began to tell our staff, present this as part of the basic aspect of Christianity. If you're a Christian, you will care for your parents. The biggest fear that our parents have when their child becomes a Christian is, now he will not look after the family obligations. He will not, for example, save money for his sister's wedding. He will not look after his parents. You know, things like that. So this became um, part of the basic Christian message that we preach to these people. If you become a Christian, you have to become a better son. You have to become a better daughter. You have to honor your parents even more. And then, without separating them from the parents, we told our staff, well, actually, we didn't tell them. It happened almost naturally. Our staff began to meet the parents. You know, so the moment somebody comes to Christ from another faith, the staff go and meet the parents. And then the, pair, the staff, because very, most often they are more educated than the parents, become like the advisors to the family. So when there's a wedding, 
the wedding is done by Buddhist things. But the staff advise them on how to do this and how to do that. And the 5C volunteers will come and clean up the house and all of that. So that Christianity became a family religion, even though most of the family members are not Christian. What we found was when this, this happened, the persecution got much less. Because the parents realized these people are committed to our, to our, you know, to, to our families also. Uh, now, uh, the, bringing the idea of holiness, uh, again, as I went through the epistles of Paul, I realized that often Paul motivated people to holiness using shame categories. For example, these things should not even be talked about among you. I mean, that's a shame category. That's part of the community that you're living in. If you don't care for your old relatives, you're worse than an unbeliever. Shame on you, you know. So, so we realized that what Paul was trying to do was to develop new community values in this community. And that is one way of developing holiness within new believers. In other words, you develop this community value. And because our people respond to community values, they will respond to that value because it's part of the community. It's part of this community value. So, um, so um, shame cultures influence the way uh, we look at the Bible. And we found that the Bible does talk about that. Now, behind all of this is the belief that the Bible is a comprehensive book. That everything for doctrine and um, principles, okay, not, not every detail, but principles for every Doctrine and behavior is found in the Bible. Um, uh, the sufficiency of scripture. Sufficiency of scripture to every challenge. So when you face a challenge, you go to the Bible, ask what does the Bible say about this challenge? And then try to apply that. Now, around the uh, mid, uh, late 70s, uh, what happened was that the evangelical churches began to form. Churches began to have youth fellowships. And we had been working for about 10 years primarily with uh, nominal Christians. Once we realized that the youth fellowships have taken that place, we said, now we will stop concentrating on Christians. Let's go to the unreached. Uh, in other words, non-Christian uh, people. And, and so we had to ask ourselves, now how are we going to do this? This is a completely different method of ministry now. So uh, the, at, around that time, a paper came from the Lausanne Committee called the Lausanne Occasional Paper on Gospel and Culture. So over a period of several months, slowly we went through that paper how, uh, about how the gospel can be separated. And then I stumbled upon Acts 17 uh, on Paul's ministry in Athens. And I thought, this is a good model for how we are going to reach these non-Christian people. So, uh, because that, that's, a, that's a thing that that X was X 17 was with uh, people who had no Jewish background. So, uh, so um, for example, Paul used the method of Socrates. He was found, Socrates used to be in the Agora, in the, in the marketplace, uh, you know, uh, talking uh, philosophy with people. Paul did the same thing. In the city of Socrates, he did what Socrates did. So we asked, now, how are we going to reach these Buddhist and Hindu young people? Well, they like drama, they like music, they like sports, and poorer youth are concerned about their education because education is very tough in our country, very competitive. So let's look at these four areas, we said. Drama. Do we know how to do drama in a way that the Buddhists will understand? We realized we didn't. So we got non-Christians to teach us drama. Music. Our music is very different to their music. So we sent our staff to learn music from non-Christians so that we learn the style of their style of music. And, uh, and I'm, my second love is music. You know, I love music. And, uh, and I have been trained in Western music. So I thought um, I'm going to be quiet and not do much. Um, in fact, I went on a six-year, about a five or six-year fast. When I didn't listen to Western music, I just tried to immerse myself in Sri Lankan music. When I was a little confident, I was afraid to sing in public. I used to sing a lot those days, you know, in English. 
Uh, I was a little afraid to do this. But once I was in a village, and the volunteer said, hey, Ajit, you must sing a song for us. So I thought, oh, village people, uh, I think I can get by. So I sang a singalese song. And after the meeting was over in the evening, I was coming to the staff worker's house when they were imitating me, singing. And they were all having a good laugh because they were imitating a Westerner trying to sing uh, this Sinhalese music. And it was a big joke to them. So I realized I had a long way to go still. Uh, so the music is very different. So we had our people learn music from them. And, um, and um, uh, with the English-speaking youth, especially because we are trying to reach English-speaking youths who are alienated from society, uh, from, from the church, sorry, um, it became harder and harder. None of these things seemed to work with them. And still, uh, working with westernized youth is our hardest work. My son is trying to do that. Uh, he just sent me an SMS this, uh, this morning to say that they had a person who was into heavy metal, uh, the, uh, the, the black, what they call black heavy metal. Uh, you know, it's a, almost a satanic. They, they invoke Satan in their music. And one of those boys came to his camp that he had about a month ago. And at the camp, he was going through severe uh, attack. And he slit his uh, wrist uh, with a knife. And, uh, you know, they had to be careful with him. And then what happened was that he went to school and he, 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 he didn't get converted at the camp. His, his father was a Muslim, mother is a Buddhist. And, and he uh, was behaving so badly in school that he was uh, sent out of school. He has been sent away from the school. And now he's living with my son uh, in, in my son's room. And my son is trying to minister to him. Uh, so it was very hard to, to work with this group because the traditional things that attract poor youth don't attract rich youth. So they had to learn new things. Uh, we had to learn adventure outreach, for example, white water rafting, and that's the thing that westernized youth like. Uh, in, in our single and Tamil ministries, they like soccer and cricket. Westernized youth like baseball, uh, sorry, basketball. So we had to learn, we had to uh, work through basketball with this particular group. But this all came from the idea that Paul, when he was in the city of Socrates, he did the work of Socrates. And then he, he used, he dialogued. It says dialogoma, using that word. He dialogued uh, with, with, with the people. Now, I, I studied that word, and I realized that um, the, the Kittel's Dictionary, uh, at that time, uh, that's what I used. Uh, it said that, uh, that uh, the dialogue in the New Testament is not the same as dialogue in the classical Greek idea. In the classical Greek idea, you dialogue uh, in order to arrive at truth. It's a quest for truth. Whereas in, um, in, uh, in the New Testament, dialogue was a way of communicating a message. So there was a message. In fact, uh, Howard Marshall had written an article somewhere that uh, which said that it's almost a word for preaching. But it seems as if there had been place for discussion, for questions, and for listening uh, in this proclamation, while, while there was a proclamation going on. And I realized the need for this because the Buddhist mind uh, is so different to our mind. Their understanding of religion is so different that, you know, uh, I preached once on John 3.16, a very evangelistic message. I thought, man, this message is so different to anything that, uh, that they have. And, um, and then there was a Buddhist in the audience. So I, I went to him and said, I'm very happy to see you here. What do you think about my message? What do you think about what I said? Oh, he said, very good, wonderful what you said. Our religion takes, teaches the very same thing that you taught. You know, and I thought I had given a message that was totally different to, these, uh, to the, to the uh, Buddhist message. But what had happened was he had taken my words and given them Buddhist meanings and ended up with a Buddhist message out of my Christian evangelistic sermon, you know. So, I rea so we realized that when you're working with these people, you will have to do a lot of, you know, talking, talking, back and forth, back and forth. 
And now we are finding in our evangelistic camps that many of the commitments take place in the small groups. When they are discussing about this, uh, some people say, yeah, we'd like to give our life to Christ. Now, how can we get this message across? Well, Athens tells us, some people thought that Athens was a failure. But anyone who works with totally unreached people would realize that reaching these people, especially people who have intellectual grasp of their religion, is very difficult. And if Paul had a member of the Areopagus and a few others come to Christ, he, he was a roaring success. But, but to remember that we have to be patient with people from other faiths. Their worldview is so different to ours that it will take a long time for them to understand this worldview. We had a lady uh, who's, uh, I talked about her, I think, yesterday, today, this morning, uh, where uh, she died. She was a me like a member of our family. She was hit by a, a bus and died last week, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, she came to Christ uh, by seeing her son, her brother, converted in our ministry. And there was such a change that she got attracted to Christ because of the change in her brother. And then she was attracted to the kindness of Jesus. And, and so she said, I want to become a follower of Christ. She was baptized in our church. But after some time, we realized she hasn't understood grace. She has take, given uh, Christian terminology to her Buddhist categories. So whereas once she was meditating, going to the temple, giving alms, now she was coming to church, uh, paying her tithes, and things like that. It took her about five years to understand what grace is all about. But when she did understand, she became a wonderful Christian. And, but, but, but you can see that when you're working with people of another faith, sometimes uh, the, the change takes a long time to take place. Then, um, Athens, in his sermon in Athens, he started with God, not with Jesus. And he started by explaining who God is. So, we realized that our people have such a different understanding of God. In fact, the Buddhists say God is not necessary. Uh, evolution has proved that there is no God. So in our evangelistic camps, what we do is that the first session is, is there a God? And if there is a God, what type of person is he? Then we talk about the human predicament, that, uh, uh, that we are fallen, you know, what has happened in the garden and things like that. Then we talk about, uh, uh, that is creation and fall. Then we talk about Jesus and what he has done um, on the cross and then uh, the resurrection and then how the Holy Spirit comes and, and ministers to you. So every day in the morning we teach this method. In the evening, there is uh, felt needs like identity, education, poverty, and felt needs, sex, love and marriage, parents, things like that. And, and plus the most exciting, fun time you could possibly have. Uh, that, that's how we developed our camps. Uh, but, but, but one of the things that really struck me was uh, Paul's, Paul's talk in Athens influenced the way we developed the program. But that is also the method that is used in systematic theology. So I realized that systematic theology gives us a form for evangelistic strategy and also for worship. Uh, in, in other words, it, in, um, fashioning of, for example, in the fashioning of worship, you take the themes of systematic theology and use scripture, song, praise, confession, using a theme, and through that theme, a, a systematic theology theme, you praise God on that day for that particular theme. And that became a way by which this message could be communicated. So, so the Bible gives us the, the message. Systematic theology could give us a method, a system of how we can share uh, this message. Uh, so with, with time, we began to realize other things. For example, um, one of the words I studied a lot in the early years was this word peito, uh, which is persuade. What does it mean to persuade people? It means that people have made an intellectual decision to leave behind their past life and to follow, not, an, not intellectual only, an intellectual and a volitional decision. Uh, to leave behind the past life and to start a new life. Uh, now, um, this realize, we realize that our camps, our camps is where most of the people come to Christ. Uh, and so, 
um, at our camps, we could do some things that make this difficult, make peito difficult, persuasion difficult. For example, we could develop such an emotionally high pitch at the camp that it affects the decisions of the people. In other words, the decision they make is an emotional decision caught up in the whole structure, in the whole fellowship, the, the, the beauty, the aura, the loveliness of this camp. They could make uh, an emotional decision uh, and, uh, and, and, and later on come back and when they come back to their senses, what, what did they do? You know, that sort of idea. So what we decided was, don't give the invitation too many times. Wait till the end of the camp and give it once or twice. Don't give it too many times because then you just raise the pitch of the thing. Then, don't have the program too packed because then they'll be very tired and in their tiredness, they can't make an intellectual decision, a, a volitional decision. Don't tell tearjerker stories before invitations, you know, so that, so that they respond to the message, not to the feeling. Um, and so, uh, so, so, so that, that, that influenced us. Um, now, sometimes, especially with Western youth, we realize that the biblical content will have to be given in a variety of ways. I said that in the morning we teach on the doctrine of God, for example. Now, those days we'd have a long talk on the doctrine of God. We still have a talk. But what we do is, early morning, uh, our culture has a place for meditation. So we have an early morning meditation time. But they meditate on a passage of scripture. So we give a passage that describes the nature of God, like the Lord's my shepherd or something like that. Uh, so they read that. Then we have a time of worship. And on the day that we are talking about God, all the worship is on God, is focused on God. This is the nature of God. So all the songs are chosen in a way that the Christians can praise God for who, he, who God is. And the non-Christians can understand that this is the God these people are worshipping. Then you'll have a testimony of some aspect of God, of what God has done to their life. And then we might have a drama. And then there'll be a talk. And then there will be uh, on God. And then there'll be a discussion in groups where they discuss what they have been thinking about the whole day. Earlier, there was one message, but now with postmodernism and all of that, with people not, not finding, uh, finding long talks difficult, we had to use all these different methods, but it's giving a single, the same message as before. In other words, the form differs, but truth always remains supreme. You know, we are, the truth doesn't change. So we, we are always looking at everything from how can we communicate this truth. Um, then... Uh, then as, I began, as we began to work with how we can develop Bible Christians, uh, help, help teach doctrine to our illiterate uh, or semi-literate uh, people who have come to Christ, we realized, um, I learned a big lesson from Methodism, which where the hymn book was their doctrine book. In other words, the doctrines were taught using the hymn book. And so... We, we, we decided if we can have doctrine and Bible-saturated worship, people learn, um, the, 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 a doctrine is presented through scripture, through a short explanation, through singing, and through praising God for that per particular nature, per aspect of God. So you, you, the, the doctrine was presented using hymnody and worship. Uh, and, and, and I still think that is uh, very appropriate for the West also. In fact, I would recommend that you take a different doctrinal theme every Sunday and use that as the basis for your worship. Um, and this is one of the best ways to teach difficult and culturally distant doctrines. How? By slipping it in. You know, uh, not, uh, not necessarily only a sermon, but it slipped in all the way. Because a worldview is imbibed. You know, a worldview is how do I live? And of course, teaching is important, but it's generally imbibed. Um, music is an aid, of course, is an aid to penetration because music is the language of the heart. And, and, and when the heart is involved, there's a greater chance of the truth going into the heart through the use of music, especially if there's a small introduction to the theme of the. Uh, it, you don't, you, one sentence, two sentences is enough. So that the people are, f are made to focus on the content of the song. 
that, that, uh, so that, that that content goes in. Um, let me take another difficult doctrine, which is the doctrine of judgment. Um, uh, one, you know, if you're going to speak on judgment and you're, you're a pastor, one message of ju on judgment you might give once in two or three years. But a message of judgment every two or three years is not going to bring judgment into the worldview of a person who has come from a totally different background. So, um, when I, was, I, I wrote a book on hell. And when I was writing that book, I had a doctrinal part and a practical part. And in the practical part, what I found out going through the passages on hell is that Jesus slipped in the doctrine of hell, all of judgment, all the time. He didn't, you know, once in a way he may have a whole parable about judgment. But generally, it was slipped in. And so that, um, you know, uh, we, we, we begin, people begin to understand how doctrine influences everything they do. The doctrine of judgment. So, um, you know, you, you, uh, you, you uh, talk about, you know, lying, for example. And, and then, you know, of course, the Bible says that at the judgment, things that were hidden are going to be proclaimed private, in, in public. And that's going to be a great shame to, our, uh, to, to these people. So, so, so no, that, that's all that's said. But it's just slipped in. All the time you slip in the doctrine. So that people get used to seeing how doctrine influences everything we do. You know, how, how, how a particular doctrine. So, um, so that's something that uh, we, we began to work with. Um, and, um, and uh, right. And then um, uh, the same thing happened as we began to understand the wider mission of God. That if you're going to be true Christians, we have to be involved in social work and justice and issues like that. So these things, uh, education, poverty alle alleviation, became very important to us. But the fact of judgment always remained there in our minds. In other words, what I'm saying is, if these people don't accept Christ, they're eternally lost. And all the education that we do is not going to be very helpful if they don't find Christ before they die. So there is that burden that uh, you look at people through biblical eyes. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 17 describes this. Uh, the love of Christ controls us. Very often we stop there. But it says, because we are convinced. There's a conviction. And what is that conviction? One died for all, therefore all have died. And those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him, but for him who for their sakes died and was raised. In other words, people... Christ has died for all. People should not be living um, for them, you know, for themselves. Then, therefore, we no longer look at anyone from a human perspective. Though once we looked at Christ from that perspective, we don't look at people using human criteria anymore. What is the criteria that we use? Verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. In other words, uh, this is a, we look at people from biblical eyes to say, that these people don't, they need the savior. So always evangelism, our heart has to beat with evangelism because people are lost. And the most loving thing you can do to a person is to share the gospel with that person. That also becomes a motivation in situations hostile to evangelism. We are living in a situation that's very hostile. My son is working in a town that is the center of opposition to Christianity. And if they know what he's doing, he's going to get into a lot of trouble. And the father, who happens to be the leader of Youth for Christ, would love to tell him, son, be careful. Uh, you know, uh, be a, go a little slow. But I have not said that to him. Because people are lost and need the Savior. And he has to learn how he's going to be wise, but still to take the gospel to these people. So, uh, what we are talking about is let the whole Bible always speak to us. One, um, one discovery of a truth should not eclipse other discoveries. The moment we decide, realize the wider mission, don't forget the other aspects of the, of the truth. Well, one more point I have, and this is how scripture influences team meetings. Our leadership team usually meets once every three months, and we meet for about two or three days 
because we are you know all over the country so they come together and, and we meet to discuss and to pray and things like that and uh, and uh, what, what we thought is let's have all our meetings start every day with a dose of scripture so what we used to do is to discuss among the leaders who are around what is the passage that can speak to us in our present situation what is our agenda and how is there a passage that deals with this agenda and then we, what, what we do is we take that passage and bring a few commentaries, but we tell them use the commentaries only if you have to. Uh, during that quiet time, they will go and study this passage. And, and when they study the passage, uh, they will ask the question, what is God hearing our movement through this passage? So for example, we went through uh, in, 19, uh, in 2009 and 2010, we went through a huge process of structural change where the structure that had served us for 30 years was now going to be changed. It was a very traumatic thing. It still is traumatic, very hard to change a huge structure like this. It was, we were based on languages. In other words, it was an ethnically divided ministry, and we decided to make it into a geographically divided ministry with the different ethnic groups in one team now. So it was a big change. It was a big paradigm shift for us. But... Um, but so uh, once when the staff met, we studied Acts 6, how structural came to the early church uh, when the widows were, you know, neglected and how they brought a new structure into the church. The next time we studied Acts 15, where there was doctrinal change based on, uh, you know, the, about circumcision and all of that, the Jerusalem Council. So, so we, we, we found that God was really speaking to us, you know, on how we should do this. And, um, and so... When the volunteers, uh, when the structure had been developed, we were going to present it to our volunteers. There, there would be about 250 there. And, um, and the, the, the structure was going to be introduced. The day the structure was introduced, the staff, the leaders, asked me to give two talks in the morning. Uh, one on Acts 6 and the other on Acts 15. So I prepared my messages and uh, we were in a tent. And um, I think there were more than 250 people. Anyway, the tent was very hot. And they had, uh, they had been talking, you know, met after a long time, so they were talking late into the night. Tent was hot. I gave my talk on Act 6, and it was a disaster. I didn't realize it was a disaster. I thought I had done very well. But when I finished, different staff, you know, came trying to respectfully tell me, you didn't communicate. You know, um, uh, one, one person came and said, ah, it might be good if you use a little more stories, you know, and like that, you know. So I realized this had not gone well. And Acts 6 was the easy passage. Acts 15, to me, was the more complex passage. So, uh, so I went to one of my colleagues and said, what am I to do? These people haven't got what I wanted to say. So my colleague said, why don't you teach a little and then break them into uh, groups and let them apply that little section that you taught. Uh, and, you know, go on like that without having one talk. So I did that. We were doing Acts 15. And then when we came to the point where the Jews made a, con uh, where the Gentiles were asked to make a concession for the Jews. Don't uh, stay away from food offered to idols and, um, you know, what, what is it, uh, blood, you know, from blood. Which was later considered unnecessary. But at this time, they were asked to make a concession. So I gave the principle behind it, that sometimes you have to change your own convictions for the sake of others. And, and then I asked them, I, I left them with the question, what are the concessions that you will have to make now that the two races are going to get together and work in a common group? So they went and broke into groups and discussed. And then I asked, okay, you share what you share, what, what you learn. So one, one person got up and said, uh, we felt that it's really bad. You see, uh, we, we have a war going on in the country between the two races, and YFC works with both races. And, um, and uh, the Tamils are the minority, and the Sinhalese are the majority. Tamils are found in India also. So one of the Sinhalese staff got up and said, we felt it's not right that a lot of our Tamil brothers and sisters support India when Sri Lanka is playing India in cricket, you know, and, um, and uh, you know, uh, that's not right. They should be supporting Sri Lanka. So when this person said this, the 
some people clap. That's right, that's right, you know. And, uh, and then, so now I was thinking, you know, I was praying a lot. Man, I really prayed that day. Actually, the, at the end of the day, I had an unbearable migraine because it was such a strain, this, this, this meeting. Um, and um, so I, I said, well, you know, God has placed us in Sri Lanka. I'm a Sinhalese, so I have to be very careful now. Um, God has placed us in Sri Lanka, and it would be nice if you, uh, if you can support Sri Lanka, but I don't think as a Christian you can... In, you have to insist, because this is where our mission is, it will be nice. So then people clapped again. Then we asked the question, but why is it that our Tamil brothers and sisters feel more closer to India than to Sri Lanka? And we asked them to say, why? And the idea came, we are, we are given the feeling that we are second class, we are not welcome here. One person from the north got up and said, I was uh, a friend of mine and I, we were going on the road, we were stopped by the police and we were asked some very rude questions and, and then the, the, the teacher, the, this friend said, you know, aren't, we, aren't I also sing, uh, Sri Lankan? Why are you talking to me like this? Am I not a Sri Lankan? And he said that the service person slapped him. And so that was enough for us. I said, can you see what we have done to our Tamil brothers? We have made them feel not wanted. We've got to do something about this. We've got to apologize. And we've got to ask ourselves, who is a Sri Lankan? We need to develop a new identity of Sri Lankans. And there was a lot of discussion on this. And then one brother, a Sinhalese, a young fellow, came up and said, in the history of the world, there have been times when things like this have gone on. And then we have come to a point where we say, this is right, we must go forward from this point. I think this is one of those times. God has spoken to us about how we have to be different in Sri Lanka. We've got to go on from now. So then we had a time of prayer, everyone holding hands, sang a few songs, and committed ourselves in a fresh way to be truly Sri Lankan and to embrace every person in the country. Sinhalese, Tamil, Muslim is another race. The Muslims, uh, we, we, we are going to embrace all of them as equally part of Sri Lanka. It was a really one of those moments, you know, that, that God really touched the people. So, so I, I just want to leave you with the idea that it's exciting when you try to take this message and apply it in ministry strategy. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it opens a lot of doors to help us to, to continue to serve God faithfully. Okay, that's what I wanted to share. Thank you very much. That was uh, helpful and encouraging, I think. Very much so. We're very grateful. We have about 15 minutes left for questions and answers. And I'm going to do this democratically, which means if you come up to these two microphones, the first person to a microphone gets to ask the first question, and then we'll go to the other microphone and back and forth. So if someone would come again, about 15 minutes for question and answer. Uh, I'm a church history teacher at TEDS with special responsibility for teaching in American church history. And it seems to me that uh, as, as an American, as an, as an American church historian, sometimes the, the gospel, sometimes the scriptures are over-contextualized where I live. And one of the things I've appreciated about your message today and your messages on campus all week is this strong commitment to scripturally saturated ministry, Bible-based ministry. And one of my frustrations as somebody who tries to do biblical ministry in the U.S. is that it, it, I think it's a different frustration from the Sri Lankan context where the idea is that the, 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 the Buddhist Sinhalese culture is, is so different from uh, the cultures of Christianity that the hard job of contextualization is taking scripture and finding ways to connect with, with where people are so they can get it, so they can understand it. In my own context, it seems like a, a big challenge a lot of the time is that people don't distinguish clearly enough between being a good American, 
a moral, upright American and being a Christian because we're over-contextualized. So I guess my question to you is, from your Sri Lankan perspective or from a global Christian perspective, can you encourage people like me and counsel people like me with regard to the Bible and context kind of balance? I think we all agree the Bible's the most important thing, and what we're trying to do is find good, effective, culturally effective ways to communicate it. But as you look from where you stand at U.S. culture and U.S. ministry, do you have any counsel for us as we struggle with the same kind of balance? Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know whether this is the answer to your question, but I have felt that one of the greatest challenges in the States today is uh, that the evangelist has to go one step back. Earlier we had evangelists for the gospel. Now we need evangelists for truth. In other words, we, have to, we, 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 uh, the, we are living in an age when people don't regard holy book as holy anymore. Um, and, and that words are not as important as, 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 as we used to think in those days. So that we could, earlier we could persuade people by giving truth. But now people don't think truth is important. Um, I think uh, Carl Henry's uh, six volume, uh, God, Revelation and Authority, his first chapter was, I can't remember the title, but it's something like the crisis of word and truth or something like that, was the first chapter where he said people are finding words difficult to believe. And my, uh, my prayer, okay, and huge push to the Western church is work terribly hard on presenting the Bible attractive, as an attractive book uh, to, uh, to the American people and work terribly hard on overcoming the basic problems that the American people have towards evangelicalism. Uh, if, I, if, I, if I'm reading it correctly, I think they see us as arrogant people who, who have lost our former position of authority and who are trying to push our views by the use of force, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and law and history and all of that. Uh, you know, this is, this is not America. I mean, I think there is a place for that in the intellectual sphere, but not in the emotional sphere where it's happening now, you know, all these, uh, you know, placards and people going up. And so I think they're giving this idea that we are an angry bunch of people who have lost Whereas we should be focusing on mission. You know, uh, there is need in this country. People are needy, you know, and, and so we should, be, we should be giving ourselves to being servants of this community. Uh, I thought it was a real shame that the people who were first known to embrace AIDS patients were people like Elizabeth Taylor and Diana and people like that. We should have, I, I think we were doing it, but it, was, it never got press, you know? But we should have been known as those who care for these people. So I think there is a real call to, to on the one hand, be evangelists for truth, and on the other, to be evangelists for truth by showing how truth is incarnated in servanthood. This is the great challenge I feel facing the evangelical church. Uh, we can protest about this and this and this and all, all sorts of things to protest about. But I think our primary focus should be how can we serve the hurting people in this nation. And people are hurting, there's no doubt about it. You know, um, I, I was just so sad to hear about that boy who jumped out of the bridge. He came from a Christian home uh, lives close to where my brother lived uh, and, um, and then, you know, he found himself so alienated from life that he had to jump out of the bridge. And, and, and if there is some way, if we can show that we, we do not like homosexual practice and disapprove of it, but we will die to help a homosexual. If we can, if we can somehow portray that vision, I think we will be incarnating the word 
and opening the door for America to take the word seriously again. I don't know whether that answers your question, but that's the way I have looked at this issue. Uh, um, maybe I can follow up on uh, Doug's question uh, this way. Just even hearing um, some of the t work that you were doing in ministry, which is really exciting, I was trying to think about in the context here when um, well-meaning Christians are wrestling with the same things in the Western context. I, th I think sometimes the fear or worry is, uh, you know, what the missiologists call, you know, syncretism. That you know, in our in our effort to to try really hard to uh, contextualize, which I think what, is what Doug was talking about, contextualize the gospel and trying to communicate in new forms. How, how do we keep the balance from going too far in the direction where? you know, it becomes so familiar to the non-Christian that it, are we really talking about biblical Christianity any longer? Did you, do you, did you wrestle with that in your context, or are there some differences between the two different contexts related to that? Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, um, as, as we began to study Buddhism and Hinduism, uh, I began to, well, not I, our body, we, we, we felt that there were three disciplines that are involved for anyone, you know, going out on, the, on that, out on limb, trying to be contextual. Uh, and these are the, the three disciplines we felt was uh, to be under the totality of Scripture. In other words, all the time to be going through all of Scripture. For example, uh, the, the stark reality of lostness is something that we should never forget. That's what I tell our social workers, um, that they have to remember that these people are lost. And, you know, things like that. So the totality of Scripture to influence us at any one time, to make sure that the Old Testament, the New Testament, Paul, you know, anyone who takes Paul seriously would realize how, how primary the gospel, you know, the gospel of atonement is to Christianity. And if, if you take Paul seriously, you cannot, you know, just put lump evangelism along with everything else as just, you know, you, you know what I'm tr trying to say here. So that's one, scripture. Secondly, community, a critical community. I think all theologizing must be done within community. That's another challenge that I have for the Western church. I think Western understanding of academic freedom is so, uh, uh, so sort of sacrosanct or whatever, what you call it, that, that uh, you, 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 there isn't this sense of theological accountability within the body where people can be called to account for what they are saying. I, I really believe that the, all Christian ministry must take place in a body context. And if that is so, even theologizing should be done within a body context. In the body context, like in, Athens, in, in uh, Antioch, they said there were prophets and teachers. Prophets generally are people who bring new things. Teachers are people who uh, focus on the fundamentalists, on the fundamentals. So the, the prophets will make sure that there is change, there is creativity. The teachers will make sure that it's done responsibly. So I think if we can have a critical community that, that moderates all this, that we listen, that we, that we develop uh, the habit of listening to people. Because when you're doing this, you're going to, sincere people are going to be really mad at you. And it's good to listen to those sincere people. Because some, they, they may be saying something right. You know, and so that, that's the second one. The third one is never to, to, to downplay or reduce the emphasis on evangelism. People are lost, they need the savior, we have to go and share this gospel. So we found that these three, you know, an evangelistic program, uh, uh, a body context, and uh, uh, having the whole of scripture minister to us, are good moorings to people who are trying to launch out into something new like that. Uh, we've got one minute. Is it a short question? It's a short question. I don't okay. know if the answer really short. <laughs> the answer um, may not be short. <laughs> just about, uh, you spoke about um, shame and, you know, if, if in the biblical communities shame was more natural than it is to Westerners, what would you say to us Westerners of how we would um, be faithful to Scripture in a context where 
shame is not as much of an element as guilt and other things. Yeah, well, um, one of the things is, now Paul, for example, spoke on the cross uh, to people who thought that the cross was a stumbling block and uh, folly. But when he went to uh, uh, Corinth, he preached nothing but Jesus and him crucified. So, so the fact that a thing is culturally distant doesn't mean that we mustn't speak it. We must look for better ways of presenting it. So that's just one principle. But what you say may not be 100% true now. Because, you know, as I was studying shame culture, uh, I realized that this came, shame culture came out of uh, not believing, a uh, lot of the shame culture in our part of the world has to do with not believing in a God who is absolute. Uh, and who, uh, who has communicated truth absolutely. Now, as the West, I, I thought to myself, as the West is giving up this idea of absolute truth, as it is going from a supreme God to a pantheistic understanding of God, is it going to be a shame culture? And I was so surprised when I found that somebody has written a book called Atonement in Society or something. Rob Bell, I think. Uh, no, no, I don't know his name, right? Okay, but he has written this book. And he's saying that Western culture is becoming a shame culture. And that shame is what is going to determine what is right and wrong. For example, it's not shameful to have sex outside marriage, but it's shameful to sexually abuse a child or to use sexist language in your workplace. So that the criterion now is a community-generated criterion of right and wrong. So I think shame culture is becoming a Western culture, is becoming part of Western culture. And, uh, and the answer in the book that, uh, that I mentioned was, you have to present the gospel in terms of shame categories, not in terms of guilt and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, forgiveness. Uh, I don't think that is the right answer at all. The answer is to see how you can present guilt and uh, how you can win them through using shame categories, and then present this culturally distant aspect of guilt and, uh, and shame and, um, and forgiveness uh, to a people who are culturally distant. So the answer is not to run away, but to give ourselves even more to the task of presenting biblical truth using cul uh, to culturally distant biblical truth. Well, thank you, Dr. Fernando, again, very, very much for being with us, for giving such a wonderful lecture. Maybe I'll close with this thought. I remember that uh, John Owen said of John Bunyan that if you pricked him, he would bleed the Bible. And perhaps that I was reminded as you, you talked today that we want to be so saturated with God's word. Perhaps that would be true of us as well, by the grace of God. Thank you so much. God bless you.